People are now awakened to the idea that black and brown communities are treated differently. While I was pursuing in higher education, literally building my way from the ground up, I was a home health aide. Once I entered the industrialized healthcare system, I realized that the, it was a system that was not catering to humans. The actual fact is it takes a doctor 11 seconds to interrupt a patient. Now we're in an era where everyone is aware suddenly that healthcare disparities exist. I am not someone who come from the backgrounds of people who are funded very easily. Everything that I touch will be about humanizing healthcare. Hey, hey, Unfound Nation. Dan Kihanya here, your host for Founders Unfound. Thanks so much for listening in. That was Kistine Monkhouse, founder and CEO of Patient Order, a platform that uses storytelling to improve patient experience and population health. Against the backdrop of COVID-19, we had a great discussion around healthcare inequities and patient advocacy. Our episode is sponsored by Black VC, a focused community built for and by Black investors. Check out the link in the show notes for more about their exceptional programs and events. If you ever thought about getting into venture, you definitely want to connect up at blackvc.com. That's B-L-C-K-V-C.com. Our hearts go out to the Lewis family and our nation, really, over the loss of John Lewis. He was a true leader who lived out his moral character with courage and conviction. His presence will be greatly missed. As always, you can find Founders Unfound anywhere you regularly listen to podcasts. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Founders Unfound. Feel free to drop us a review on Apple or Podchaser.com. And please follow, like, and share to help us grow. Now, on with the episode. Stay safe and hope you enjoy. Hello, and welcome to Founders Unfound, spotlighting the best startups you don't know yet. We bring you stories of exceptional founders from underrepresented backgrounds. This is episode number 16 in our series on founders of African descent. I'm your host, Dan Kihanya. Let's get on it. Today, we have Christine Monkhouse, founder and CEO of Patient Orator, a platform that uses storytelling to improve patient experience and population health. Welcome to the show, Christine, and thanks for making the time. Thank you so very much for having me. I'm honored. Awesome. So let's start off first with how are you and your family and how are things going overall in this epic time of COVID-19 pandemic and the civil protests? How are you doing? Well, I'd like to say that I'm most grateful for life, the fact that I'm well and not ill. And so is my family. Although there's been people in my extended family who have been affected by COVID directly by being infected, that is, and facing multiple different barriers in care. But I guess we'll get into that later. But for the most part, I'm very grateful for for the fact that I'm alive and healthy during this time. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, I think none of us will go unaffected probably by all of this going on when it's all said and done. So glad it's been minimized at least. So help the listeners understand exactly what is patient order all about? What do you do? Sure. We're a digital health startup empowering the voices of underserved patients and their caregivers by providing a mobile health application that helps patients narrate their storytelling and also match patients to healthcare resources. So the first iteration of our product is really looking at helping patients with their storytelling. We know that about 97% of people have difficulties communicating their medical symptoms to their medical provider. And when we look at people of color and underserved communities, these are lower income folks, these people face heavily by healthcare disparities, which means that they have a poor health outcomes based on their income, their socioeconomic status the color of their skin, et cetera. So our goal and our mission really is to improve population health by empowering those voices, by providing folks with the tools in the form of a mobile app so that they're best equipped to have their voices heard in their medical encounters. Great stuff. And this is one of the reasons I was excited to have you on, on the show to talk about that in the context of everything going on right now. Uh, but before we dive into the company more, let's hear more about who Christine is and who you are and where you come from. I know you're in New York, correct? That's correct, yes. Is that where you're from? 
So I'm an immigrant, and I'm very proud to be an immigrant. I was born in uh, South America in a country called Guyana. And so I'm a South American, English-speaking, have lived in New York for half of my life, if not more, at this point. And I consider myself a New Yorker, but most importantly, I'm a human being uh, from this planet Earth and so grateful for, again, life, I guess. Nice. What a rich heritage. I mean... You basically are an American like everybody else with all these rich aspects to who you are and where you're from. So when did you come to New York? Were you you still a kid or? Yes. So I was I was still a child when I came here. I think I was in my early teens. And so I went through high school in this country. I gained an education from the public school system in New York and have pretty much grown up here. So everything that I know is based on my lived experience as a New Yorker from interacting with everyday folks, just immigrants, working class folks, and people that are from diverse backgrounds. So let's explore this a little bit. So you came from another country as a teenager to to do American high school, essentially. That must have been a pretty dramatic change. What, what was that like? It was a pretty dramatic change. And I will tell you, I've never discussed this on a podcast before. So this is exciting and refreshing. <laughs> what was that experience like? I think when you're when you're coming in from another country, you have a one way of looking at things. Your, your reality has been, at least in my case, my reality was framed based on my upbringing. I grew up very Christian, I would say. And, and just knowing this one path that existed. But then as I'm becoming an adult, as a, as a young teenager or a young adult, I'm now all of a sudden exposed to all of these cultures and the American way and freedom of speech and expression and all of these amazing uh, things and different way of living and existing. And I think that was eye-opening to me. I definitely grew a lot as an individual and a lot of the ways in which I thought things should be changed. So I would say that I, just as everyone else is learning tolerance, have had to learn that, but I've learned that in my immigrant experience. Yeah, that's great. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think one of the things that people don't really appreciate is is how hard those transitions are. And even though America's, you know, supposed to be this welcoming assimilation melting pot, there's a lot more burden on the I think the immigrant side to to not just only fit in, but also this idea of what you're talking about is by definition because there are so many different cultures and backgrounds here. You have to adapt yourself, essentially, right, to figuring out how to how to maneuver and navigate that, right? Absolutely. And and what's what's interesting, and I hadn't thought about this before, but what's interesting about this time frame that we're in, where we're in the Black Lives Matter movement, where it's people of color who people who have not had the experience of living as a person of color, that is, are now awakened to the idea that Black and Brown communities are treated differently in their day to day life experience in the United States. And I think as an immigrant, when I came to this country, I have had to learn about so many different cultures and so many different ways of existing that is not a norm to mine, that I I have had to adapt to the reality of tolerance, the the reality of that, the fact that my way of thinking is not the best way or nor is it the only way to think. And so I think when you speak about adaptability, it's also looking at that tolerance piece of, of how is it that I am as an individual is coexisting with with different cultures and different people. Yeah, it, it, it's fascinating. And the irony of it, I think, is that, you know, those from backgrounds where we're not in the majority, we have the more adaptability to tolerance because we are looking for it. Right. And so it's really interesting for sure. So you went to public high school in New York, and that's quite an experience. I have several friends who went through that. And so what what happens after high school? Did you have any thoughts about what you wanted to do or any lifelong dreams or anything at that point? So before I even came to this country, I had a lifelong dream of changing the world. As, as a child, I think I forgot the name of the movie that I'd watch, but I'd watch this movie and it dramatically impacted me. And it was Hotel Rwanda. Oh, right. Yeah. Yes. And Hotel Rwanda as a child, I don't think I should have watched that movie because it scarred me, but in the best possible way ever. 
it made me aware of the fact that there are so many differences within even a singular culture and that there, there's people that have and there's people that don't have. And so being aware of those things just kind of shaped and made me aware of the fact that I would do something different in this world. I have also always been inspired by Oprah, not because she's on television, but because of the impact of the work that she's done. As a little black girl, used to watch her on my black and white TV in, in Guyana and would see her and see the way in which she would bring communities of people together both black and white people and brown people and everyone in between that were fans of hers. And I think that's a powerful thing if you're thinking about storytellers and, and the way in which they can bring folks together. And I think I've always been inspired by her and always been just in awe of, of her humanitarian efforts. So always knew I wanted to change the world, just didn't know how that would be. After I graduated high school, I didn't have the same opportunities as the, the folks that I graduated high school with. I actually went to community college, which again, I haven't spoken about this ever in public, <laughs> but I went to community college because I couldn't afford to just go right into um, the same level of education that everyone else went into. And so I paid my way through community college into public university. And then from there, I went on to uh, a master's degree but what's interesting about my journey is that while I was pursuing a higher education, literally building my way from the ground up, I was a home health aide. And then after I was a home health aide, I worked in a long-term care setting and then at my local emergency room. And so there was this repetitiveness of continuously working in healthcare settings because to me, it was work that I was attracted to, but not really understanding why that is. And so again, going back to the fact that I'd always wanted to change the world from since I was a little girl, but not quite knowing that healthcare would be the way in which that would play out. So in, in many ways, because of necessity, because of the fact that of the, the path that I've had to take, I was forced into healthcare. And it just so happened that those worlds collide where the humanitarian in me and both everything else that I wanted to do just collided perfectly. Yeah. So let's talk about that. I, I'm sensing a little chicken and egg. So hard hustle, you're working and going to school. And so let's talk about how did that connection for your want and your ambitions around changing the world, connecting to healthcare, did you get the jobs first and then say, wow, I really want to go to school and, and learn how to, you know, sort of quote unquote master this? Or did you go to school thinking, well, Healthcare, public policy is a great place for me to do this. And then these jobs are kind of a way for me to be on the front line to learn what's happening. Like, which sort of tipped to the other first? I'm trying to understand that. That'd be really a cool thing to dive into. Most of my journey has been out of necessity. I don't know if that makes sense, but sure. I my job as a home health aide is because I couldn't get a job anywhere else. And because I couldn't get a job anywhere else, I resorted to that. And if you look at the people who are on the front lines in long-term care settings and also in these professions, there are women, first of all, and mainly women immigrants. And that is why you see a lot of times these workers are which is a whole other issue. These workers are, they have very low income and are treated very poorly in their profession. And so it, out of necessity, that's that's where I started. But in that journey, fa falling in love with, with this idea of the healthcare being this healing experience where one human is interacting with another human and healing them back to strength and health. And so that's how that happened. Wow, makes sense. And obviously, you've gone on to, to like you said, you went through community college, then undergrad degree and a graduate degree. So kudos to you. I, I had to stop each time to do those things. <laughs> I could not multitask the way that you did. So that's really admirable. And so I imagine through both your academic work and your jobs, you really got a great insight into this idea of inequity in healthcare in the United States. Absolutely. While I was on the front lines, especially when I was working at my local emergency room, I saw that there was high hospital readmission rates, especially or particularly for people of color and lower income communities. But I questioned why was it that no one was paying attention to it? It seemed as though folks were not 
investing in, let's say, for example, improving patient experience. And But on the flip side of that, while in the night, I was actually on the front lines seeing this play out. In the, in the daytime, I would go to school. And what I would learn is that policy, public policy, that is, ties into every experience that we have. And it accounts for why there are certain populations of people that will thrive and certain populations of people um, that will not thrive. And so having that, that firsthand experience of exposure where Black and brown people were being readmitted for chronic illnesses that were being seen in the emergency room as opposed to uh, by uh, ongoing care, it brought awareness to a lot of this disparities that the most of America is now awakening to. Yeah. And th- this goes back to the conversation we were having a little earlier about just how people who are not vulnerable to those inequities are now beginning to see them. It's almost like the fog is being lifted and they're starting to see through the eyes of those who essentially suffer. And so at some point, you made the decision around starting a company and doing patient order. Were there were there were there aspects of your journey that were the catalyst for that, or is that something that you had been thinking about for a while? How did the how did the the kernel of the idea come to you? I think it was based on a buildup of frustration and moral conflict within myself. I spoke about my experience in home care, which I loved. But once I entered the industrialized healthcare system, I realized that it was a system that was not catering to humans. It was catering for numbers. And throughout my journey, when I was in long-term care, for example, uh, providing care to the elderly witnessing abuse and, and knowing to myself, like, this is just wrong. And then in, in actually working at my local emergency room and seeing that people of color and p- places that are densely populated, the patient experience is so poor where people are waiting for, for care at long hours. And then ultimately working in care coordination, where I had a patient, for example, who would lose her housing if she attended full-time school. Those are all the things that kind of collided in this one moment of, okay, the system is broken, but what are you going to do to change the narrative? And I really just started this patient orator from this space of wanting to bring awareness about healthcare disparities because I had spent my entire early adulthood working with people from so many different backgrounds. And I'm talking about black people, white people, everyone in between. And I've had these amazing human connections, but I felt as though people in society were not having these experiences because we're all caught up in our own lives and having our own experiences. I wanted to break that veil of of otherizing human experiences and really bringing people together. Because if I was seeing that there were poor white folks who were experiencing poor patient experience just as a black folks, period, then there's a connection there, right? And if we can start talking about why it is and what is that common denominator as to why these folks are having poor experiences as opposed to other groups of, of, of folks, then perhaps we can change the system. And so I found the patient orator with this goal of really raising awareness to these poor experiences. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great backdrop. And uh, let's explore that a little bit more. We will take a short break to hear from our sponsor and be right back with Christine Monkhouse from Patient Orator. Hi, this is Jean-Claude from Black VC. We're a community created to connect, engage, empower, and advance Black venture investors. And the best part is we're built for and by Black venture investors. In these unprecedented times, our mission has become clearer than ever. Black founders and investors are underrepresented and undercapitalized in the startup ecosystem. If you're an investor, an entrepreneur, or aspiring to be either one, Black VC is working hard to help you find the community and the resources that you need to further your journey. To learn more about the events and the programs that we run, follow us on Twitter at Black VC, that's B-L-C-K-V-C, or visit us on our website at blackvc.com, that's B-L-C-K-V-C dot com. Yep, you heard that correctly, no A. At Black VC, we believe that we are the change that we see, and together, we're stronger. We hope that you'll join us. So we're back with Christine Monkhouse from Patient Orator. So Christine, before we dive more into the company, I know one of the things that you've talked about, and it's pretty visible in some of your other conversations and on the website about your own personal experience and how that informed 
how and why you built Patient Order. Sure. So my personal experience with healthcare disparity is while I was building this storytelling platform, I became ill. And what happened with me was I realized that I was not being listened to. So there was a period of three years in which I was ignored by medical professionals. And I'd been seen by over six different specialists. It took the seventh specialist, the seventh medical provider, uh, in order for me to be prescribed pain medication and actually be taken very seriously. And in that experience, I took a step back and realized, wait a minute, this has been going on for three years and I had no idea until I was in a crisis. I was not aware that this is tied to the idea that black and brown people don't experience pain at the same level as their white counterparts. I had no idea that any of these issues were rooted in slavery or or in any of these injustices that has happened to Black and brown folks in this country. I just knew that I was someone who was always on the go, who wanted to build this company, who was actually building the company, and in that process was having bad days of poor experiences. Um, And so I took accountability and started looking at and, and tracking when was it that I started becoming ill and what has transpired? And that's how I even know that I've been seen by six folks before I had arrived at, 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 in crisis to that seventh person who would actually take me seriously and then ultimately refer me to someone else that would take me seriously. And so a lot of what has been built by patient orator is directly impacted by my experience, both on the front lines and as a patient myself. What would they tell you? It seems like I I can only imagine the frustration. And I've had my own personal experiences with healthcare and the dynamic you're talking about, which is sort of getting handed off, so to speak, or, 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 or pushed to the next provider and getting different messages. I mean, would they, would they tell you something wrong? Would they tell you it's not real? What would they, what would they be telling you? (laughs) So I'll give you two examples. And the first is the very first time that I, I, visited an emergency room in this country or period. My first emergency room experience was I was in severe pain and had an experience, which I don't want to get into right now, but it was a tragic moment in my life. And I'd gone into the emergency room and I'd been discharged without any pain medication, without without being taken seriously, period. And then I think after that, I was referred to, I I then decided that I needed special care and then I would continuously be seen annually for checkups. But even in those experiences, I'd been ignored. And I realized that one of the mistakes that I made along my journey was not having one particular provider and having a multitude of people within a set, let's say, practice while I would have my healthcare encounters. And even in that, have not having one particular person, let's say an OBGYN, like one particular OBGYN, let's say Dr. Mary, that I would see Dr. Mary every year or every six months. Because I didn't have that consistency, what happened was I was seeing different folks along the way. I would see, let's say, the nurse practitioner or anyone else a part of the team. And so in that, my narrative will get lost because I'm seeing all these different folks and they don't really know who I am as a person. And I think the very last experience was when I was seen by a doctor who just so happens to be a Black woman. And I, for instance, had realized that I had fibroids. And she said to me, you know, fibroids shouldn't be causing you pain in the way you're describing it. And at that point, I'd gone from two fibroids to four within a couple of months. And so it, it was just this wow. rude awakening. Yeah, it was just this rude awakening to, oh, this shouldn't cause you any pain. And and it, was, it took the, again, that seventh doctor, that seventh provider to actually say, we see this all the time. This is my specialty. This is a problem that goes undiagnosed because of the fact that providers don't take women seriously. And then if you add on top of that, the color of my skin, you have someone who meets a, a, at an intersection where it's very, very unlikely that they'd be taken seriously. Yeah, that's. Uh, thank you for sharing that story. And it's so frustrating just to hear, right? Because not only is it not serving the patient the best way, but it's incredibly inefficient and probably expensive, uh, you know, and, and probably 
one of the things that patient order can help to solve this idea of the consistent narrative and the context. I know my, my dad, who suffers from dementia, and he was an immigrant and he came to the country and was pretty healthy for most of his life. And so he didn't even really see doctors. Uh, I think his company would give him a physical every year for free and that was it. And so when we started to help him, he didn't even have a primary care physician. He didn't have any specialists. And so I have a first hand peek into the frustration of talking to somebody and having to explain over and over again what I just said as a minimum that, you know, he doesn't have mm-hmm. primary care history and so forth. So so this idea of the narrative and the context and helping patients advocate for themselves seems so powerful. So talk to us about how does patient order work and what sort of vision around how this can help and maybe give us an example or a scenario where patient order would, would come in. Sure. So we're specifically targeted towards underserved Folks, this is black and brown people and lower income communities, people that are over the age of 65 or Medicaid and Medicare recipients. Again, intentional about that because as a black woman who's been ignored, understand that problem very intimately. And the way in which the tool works is it's a mobile health application that is HIPAA compliant. The patient downloads the app onto their phones at an annual subscription rate that is affordable. They then begin to store their symptoms as it occur. But not only are they storing their symptoms, they're storing their symptoms in a formatted way that allows them or their caregiver to pinpoint key information to help their providers in the event of an emergency clearly understand what the issue is. So one of the things that sometimes I even got caught up in in the past is not knowing how to clearly articulate my problem. So I may overspeak because I'm I'm nervous or I may tell my story differently because I am afraid or intimidated by the person that is in front of me based on their hierarchy in the healthcare delivery system. And so what the app does is it really helps the patient store, track, and record their symptoms as it occurs so that when they're in those encounters, that they're empowered with the information that they need and the provider need so that they can be treated in the most effective manner. Yeah, that's a really interesting point about the intimidation. I've experienced that too. You come in and first of all, they're sort of under a timeline. So they are moving quickly and they kind of give you that about 1.5 seconds. Any questions? And then they move on to the next thing. And meanwhile, you're trying to process what they just said. So this helps the patient essentially be more prepared and more thorough in terms of what the provider's getting as the sort of backdrop to why they're sitting in front of them. Exactly. And you, you mentioned one second The actual fact is it takes a doctor 11 seconds to interrupt the patient as they're describing why they're even going to that facility or for... No way. 11 seconds? It's a fact. It can be Googled. It's a study that was done. Wow. Yes. So within 11 seconds of a person telling their story, they will be interrupted. So this is where this app helps because if you're sticking to what the facts are, you're sticking to what the points are, even if you're interrupted, you can get right back in to what the issue is and exactly what was not said. And you're ensuring that your voice is being heard in that encounter. So it's insane what those dynamics look like. I know you touched on time limitation and then there's others such as interoperability. So a patient data, from one system might not be talking to the other system. And so there's there's that siloed ecosystem of where the patient data is missing in that. How about we flip the script, which is what we're doing, right? And help the patient with having them have their own data, their own patient generated data, so that when they're going to those encounters, they have their, their own script, they have exactly what the issue are, they have the medication that they're on, everything else, and so does their caregiver if that's something that they, they want to share with them. Nice. So tell us about like the company itself. Are there, are there others working on the project? Where are you in terms of the journey of creating awareness and distribution and those kinds of things? Yeah, so we're, we're fully bootstrapped. I have a team of advisors that are just amazing. And so, uh, yes, I am a solo founder, but have this amazing team of advisors and mentors who've been a part of the journey in terms of advising, of, of what strategies to take, etc. 
But to make it very clear, it hasn't been the easiest of journeys because of the fact that I obviously could not basically bring the point home as to why it's important to address healthcare disparity pre-COVID. Now we're in an era where everyone is aware suddenly that healthcare disparities exist. Well, when I was pitching the idea a few years ago to angel investors, people didn't know health deserts existed. And for folks that don't know what a health desert is, it's basically, um, or a food desert. What a food desert is, is it's, it's when a person lives in an area where they have no access to fresh produce because of cost limitation or because they're not in proximity of those pro- produce to begin with. And so the fact that the folks that are funding startups, uh, they're not aware of these problems, and which is natural because these are folks that are very well-to-do, it, that, that made it a very difficult in, in, in this journey. Sure, that makes sense. And then in terms of the app, where is that in the journey so far? Yeah, so our, our app where we just achieved a huge milestone of having an MVP. And so having that MVP really right now testing among patients. So we, we're starting with our um, small group of 20 folks to test this app, to ensure that it's working the way it's uh, intended to. And then our long-term goal is to really adapt a machine learning capabilities to really pinpoint and target and, and help with preventative care along the line. But uh, we just achieved a major milestone of having our MVP ready. Well, congratulations. That's great. Thank you. And in terms of, so the business model, I think I heard you say was kind of this annual subscription on the patient side. Are there other partners that are connected in with this? I mean, how does it work with the healthcare providers or the insurance companies? Can you describe sort of that ecosystem around patient order? Sure. So in the long term, our goal is to be to B2B, but right now we're B2C where we're going directly to the folks that need this tool. So these are people who may have dementia, who are of a certain age, or they're caregivers. Uh, but our long-term goal is that we really envision a company that is really addressing healthcare disparity. And, and one of the most effective ways to do that is to partner with providers and with payer systems. So in the, the next few milestones, our goal really is to get to that. But right now we're testing our hypothesis to say, hey, this is a product that can um, really impact uh, health outcomes. Very cool. And are there specific targets or segments or conditions maybe that you started to focus on first or is it more broad right now? So it's not it's not more broad. It's specifically for folks that are uh, over the age of 65 that have a diagnosis of dementia um, or Alzheimer's or memory loss. The purpose for that is because this is a silent epidemic public health crisis among African Americans, and no one is talking about it. And the numbers are increasing dramatically annually in terms of the folks that are impacted by uh, dementia. And it's something that really needs to be addressed. So we are targeting folks, patient population that live with dementia or and or memory loss. And and yeah, that's that's really our goal right now. Well, that's great. Again, as somebody with family in that situation, I can definitely see that's an important thing. And the ability to have documentation or the ability to capture your thoughts, your feelings, your symptoms, the pain you have in moments of lucidity is so critical. You know, I brought my dad into the doctor and he's, you know, one time he's very chipper and he was a smart guy, still is a smart guy deep down in there. And he could, he could just it almost fool the doctor. Like there's nothing wrong with this guy. And then other times, you know, the conversation two minutes in, he'll ask the same question that he just asked and so forth. And so and you can't count on those moments of, okay, we have an appointment at four o'clock on Thursday, so you have to be able to answer questions, right? And so I think it's a great place to start. It makes a lot, a lot of sense. Sure. So coincidentally, the patient or in my home care journey, that's exactly what my patient's diagnosis was. She had dementia and I was the main member or the um, head member of her care team. And as the in-home caregiver, I was faced with the task of having to record her symptoms. Um, And I would do that on a piece of paper or in a notebook. And then the other folks that were part of the care team, such as the other aides and also her children, would ultimately review that book. 
But again, going back to what you just said, it just reminded me of what my patient would do. Uh, she would she would have these amazing conversations over the phone with her doctors and other folks that would call her up. And on the other end, you would never know that she had this this illness. And so being someone who was in the home who was able to capture that information was so critical. But then there might have been there might be other people who don't have that that particular person where this app could help that patient or it could help that caregiver specifically that's in the home to help capture that data. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, you're absolutely right. It, there's you know, I could ask you questions about competitive environment, you know, environment and things like that. But the advocacy patient representation side is so lacking that there could be a hundred companies doing this and it still probably wouldn't be enough. So I think you're really courageous for stepping out and, and taking this on. Thank you. I appreciate that. But this is not about courage. It's simply about a necessity. For me, when I look across the ecosystem of the digital health tools that exist, there's a handful that really are targeted towards people of color. And that needs to change. And I want investors and other people in the ecosystem that there are innovators like myself that are catering to a market that is overlooked. So if you think about competitive advantage, I know who the competitors are in my space in particular, but I also know that they're not targeted towards the patient population that I'm going after. And the reason why I am addressing the needs of those patient population is because A, I've lived the experience and B, I know uh, from an incentive standpoint, there aren't much being done to address these issues. Point taken. Well said. We will take another short break to hear from our sponsor. And we'll be right back with Christine Monkhouse from Patient Order. Hi, this is Jean-Claude from Black VC. We're a community created to connect, engage, empower, and advance Black venture investors. And the best part is we're built for and by Black venture investors. In these unprecedented times, our mission has become clearer than ever. Black founders and investors are underrepresented and undercapitalized in the startup ecosystem. If you're an investor, an entrepreneur, or aspiring to be either one, Black VC is working hard to help you find the community and the resources that you need to further your journey. To learn more about the events and the programs that we run, follow us on Twitter at BlackVC, that's B-L-C-K-V-C, or visit us on our website at BlackVC.com, that's B-L-C-K-V-C.com. Yep, you heard that correctly, no A. At Black VC, we believe that we are the change that we see, and together, we're stronger. We hope that you'll join us. So we're back with Christine Monkhouse from Patient Orator. So Christine, you mentioned it in the last segment. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your experience has been in terms of raising money? I know you said you've been bootstrapped and you had some initial experiences. What's What's been your overall experience with trying to raise money either early on or more recently? So I, I'm finally at a place where I'm not pursuing or aggressively pursuing uh, venture capital because I gain a clearer understanding of how the ecosystem works. I understand that we're early stage. And so I understand the mindset of investors where it's all about where is the dollar sign, right? Very early on, I made the mistake of pitching an idea, and I did not understand that being someone who's from a disadvantaged background, that the same rules of the game doesn't apply to me. And so I've had to learn that the hard way in terms of investing a lot of time into pursuing or trying to pursue people or raising awareness about this issue of healthcare disparity and empowering the voices of, of people of color and other lower income folks I wasted a lot of time doing that. And now what I've done completely 360 is focus more on delivering a product to the people who will use the product. And I think once I've done that, now I've positioned myself where patient orator is growing much faster and we're making uh, much more progress than taking investor meetings, for example, or wasting everyone's time in terms of trying to pitch an idea when now we have a product that we can demonstrate and go after a hypothesis or proven a hypothesis. That's great insight. And for Unfound Nation out there, that's a great little nugget. The timing of where your company is and when you seek outside funding really can be optimized to align so that the timing works. And so if you're too early, it's it can be a challenge. And like Christine is saying, you're viewed with a different lens than if you have progress. 
And so that's definitely something that's a great lesson that you're sharing. So one of the questions I would have is, you, I mean, your business, your mission is around inequity. Do you feel aspects of inequity as a Black woman founder out in the business world? Of course I do. I, I, of course I do. I recently have been taking some time to think about my journey and have been very introspective about the fact that I am not someone who come from the backgrounds of people who are funded very easily. I just gave the example of, of people who are funded based off of a napkin idea, for example. I know that that's not something that happened in my case, for example. So as a founder of Patient Orator, I would say that I've had to stop and think and not put too much pressure on myself about achieving these ridiculous goals that other founders can achieve because they have investment dollars behind them. And so again, once I realized that the game that I was playing would be completely different because of the fact that the color of my skin and the fact that I'm a woman, I just accepted that and focused more on product and focus more on who are the people that I'm building for. So I I think mindset related, it's really about not taking these things personal for me, at least. And, and I'm, this is coming from a place of where I've recently gotten to of not taking these things personal and just really focus on building a company that is going to ultimately create the impact that I'm seeking to create. That's so liberating, right? It's <laughs> to have the, they say, you know, you can be raising money or running your company, but it's hard to do both at the same time. It's very hard. And so that's refreshing that you kind of came to that place where you could focus on, I'm serving customers, I'm serving the marketplace, I'm serving patients, and I'm going to continue to focus on that, which is, which is awesome. So tell us about, I know you have a, you recently come out with a documentary Tell us about that journey, because you don't hear a lot of entrepreneurs who basically create stories like that. So tell us about that. Yes. Yeah, so I created an award-winning documentary titled Humanizing Healthcare. Again, everything that I touch will be about humanizing healthcare. Again, going back to my background of wanting to change the world. When I was on the front lines, what I was seeing was disparities, the fact that people were not being treated equally or that they had poor health outcomes. And wanting to raise awareness about that, I found a patient orator and I started filming and putting this content out there, but not really putting it in a way that would tell a whole story. And that's where Humanizing Healthcare, the documentary comes into play. It teaches about health inequities from the perspective of the patient. But it also look at the historical standpoint of healthcare disparities as it exists. And so you will hear a lot in the media about social determinants of health, at least in my world you do. You hear a lot about social determinants of health, but what that is, is where a person live, play, work, etc. These aspects of their lives impact their health outcomes. And so this documentary look at the way in which folks are treated, black and brown folks, people with mental health issues, and all these other stakeholders. And looking at the way in which they're treated, it educates folks about, again, healthcare disparities, and it educates folks about uh, poor health outcomes. But most importantly, it activates everyone to be participants in their care. So you'll hear from providers about the fact that healthcare, that implicit bias exists in, in the healthcare setting. And you hear from historians about the fact that these are issues tied to slavery. And then you'll hear from patients who um, are people of color or poor white folks who are saying, hey, we're not treated in a humanized way and we need a system that will foster humanism. But then in the end, you'll ultimately learn that we all have to play active roles as citizens to ensure that the policies that are being developed are being developed on behalf of the people that needs it the most. And that's just the activist in me coming out. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you know, as somebody who is a, a dabbler in media, I know what effort it takes to produce high quality content. And so to make a full documentary is a is a tremendous effort. So it's, it's very cool. I've seen it and it's it's really well done. So you talked a little bit about the kind of advisor team slash mentor network support you have. 
Maybe talk a little bit about how has that helped you? Has it been easy to manage? Talk about that dynamic, I guess, because I think our audience likes to hear what does mentorship mean? How is it impactful? Maybe talk a little bit about that on your side. Sure. So there are two different types of mentors that I have, I would say. Um, They're formal and then they're informal. And I think sometimes I would say even a third where it collides, right? So I would talk about the folks that have impacted my journey, which are women of color who have basically given me advice at various points in my journey. So up until very up until this very year, I would say, I didn't know that there were other Black women who face the same journey that I do in terms of having to educate people like tremendously before you can even get into the door or continue on in, in, in that fundraising process. I didn't know this existed, but it took getting around a group of incredible, high-achieving Black women in health tech and digital health to really listen and learn from them about their particular journey and the journeys of others. So that's an informal, uh, I think, mentorship situation that resulted in me being both awakened and and aware of what what the landscape looks like. And then there's other cases where, for example, because I'm not a technical founder, I would meet with folks, let's say, once a month, and they would provide advice based on the particular part of my journey that I'm a part of. Like, let's say, before I had a product, they would advise on what I should be asking uh, developers when I'm interviewing them, or the, or what are my priorities and how to set up the timelines and things like that. So I think that that, that mentorship relationship has played a huge journey because I in no way hold the answers to everything. I just know that this is the product that I'm creating because of the impact that I want to ultimately leave. And having these relationships in place have helped me navigate the journey of how to go from idea to a a finished product, which will ultimately lead to the impact that I'm creating. Love it. That's such an important aspect of the entrepreneurial journey for everybody is the ability to be coached and to seek out those, those hacks and those shortcuts and those things that help you avoid, you know, mistakes or or going down the wrong path. So as we get ready to wrap up, one of the questions we like to ask is, if you could go back in time to say the five year ago, Christine, and give yourself advice about the entrepreneurial journey, what to expect, what to look out for, what to do or not do. So anything that comes to mind that you feel like you would let her in on? First of all, I'd like to say that I I wouldn't change anything about my journey because of the wisdom that I've gained. And I don't think anyone will understand that, even though the journey that I've had has not been the easiest. This has been one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my entire life, is to pursue a mission of improving the lives and well-being of other people. And if I can go five years ago, or even if I can speak to an entrepreneur that's thinking about going into entrepreneurship, I would say start planning early, start networking. I spent the last two years of my life networking across the healthcare and digital health ecosystem. It took so much effort and it took so much of my time because I didn't have the social network to stand on. And so now I'm in a space where people know who I am but that is still not enough in order for me to reach the milestones and the goals and, and grow in the way that patient orator intends on growing. So I would say start networking early, building relationships, uh, managing those relationships, being realistic about what can be accomplished, and just don't give up, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Absolutely. And you're so right about the wisdom, right? That's what they say, right? The learning happens when we have missteps or we have setbacks or we have failures or crises. It's it's hard to have the same level of insights when things are going well. Well, this has been a great conversation. And as we wrap up, first of all, is there ways that people can find out more about patient order and also about the documentary that you want to share? There are ways for people to get a hold of you or if they want more information, what would you like to share? So personally, I am very visible on social media. I can be found at Kistine M, that's K-I-S-T-E-I-N and the letter M. 
Also, you can find more information about a documentary via uh, patientorator.com and also about the app that we're building. We do plan on revamping our website in the very near future, but uh, if you need to get a hold of me or the work that we're doing, please do visit the website or just email me directly at Christine at patientorator.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christine. I really appreciate you taking the time. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. I'm honored for this opportunity. I appreciate the work that you're doing. We'd like to thank our guest, Christine Monkhouse, and our sponsor, Black VC. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or simply go to foundersunfound.com forward slash listen to. That's listen, T-O. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Founders Unfound. This podcast was produced by Dan Kihanya. Editing and production by Internet Radio Corporation. Social media and other promotion by Umama Marzouk. Our music was composed by Bobby Cole, Lance Conrad, Jason Donnelly, Judson Lee, Simon Jump Philippine, and Patrick Smith. I am Dan Kihanya, and you've been listening to Founders Unfound. <laughs>